Please forgive me if I stutter, hesitate, or mispronounce anything, and for any noises in the background while reading this work. This is Passerine, Chapter 7, Part 5. Trigger warnings are in the description. What are you doing? Wilbur repeated. Filza turned slowly towards the tower's threshold, where Wilbur stood with one hand on the jab and the other around Techno's shoulder. Wilbur was the only force keeping Techno upright at the moment. By the look on Filza's face, he must have expected Techno to weigh Wilbur down more than more with the novelty of his morality, ignorant to the fact that Techno's sheer stubbornness was more than enough fuel to get him up the torturous flight of stairs. Sure, Techno felt as if each step had been hound into this darn tower, with every intent to antagonize him and him specifically, but he was here now, witnessing Philza about to make another undoubtedly big mistake, and that was all that mattered. Yes, Dream said, all former smugness wiped clean from his face. Tell him exactly what you're doing, Philza, where you're about to go. Shut up, Wilbur snapped, his eyes never wavering from his father. This doesn't concern you, you nosy piece of shirt. Father, Philza, a god amongst gods, among men, flinched at the harshness of Wilbur's tone. What did he mean? Where are you going? When Philza didn't respond, a look of horrified fury dawned on Wilbur's face. You're leaving, Wilbur said, as if the act of staying of saying it might make it false. You're actually leaving me again. Will? Philza began, loosening his grip on Dream for just one second. Techno knew a thing or two about stupid mistakes. This was one of them. The moment Philza's hand slacked, Dream pulled free and was gone, taking to the skies on, on his invisible wings. It was almost com comical, really, to think that the god that had stood over them so arrogantly just hours before would now scramble to escape the second everyone's backs were turned. If it was Philza's ascension had been the cause of the shift, then Techno would gladly sacrifice his immortality ten times over just to see the green jerk scared shirtless. Frick! Philza cursed under his breath as he spread his own wings, about to give chase, but before he could even lift one foot off the tower floor, Wilbur and Techno had already taken their positions. It took four seconds. One, Wilbur knocked on an obsidian fletched arrow into his bow, drawing his arm back as he aimed towards the lone figure in the burning sky. Two, the linked iron chains of Techno's whip rattled as he unfurled from his hand like a metal ribbon. He took one end of it and spun it in a vicious cycle, the wind whirling around him, lifting his hair from his face. He was almost delirious with pain, and he did not have a fraction of his, the strength he used to have, but if Wilbur was still standing, then Techno would be right beside him. Three, Wilbur breathed in, out. His hands were steady and sure. He was a king, and he would surrender to no god. Four, Wilbur let the arrow fly. It sang through the air, sang past the green god's head, not close enough to make him bleed, but close enough to make him pause. It was all they needed. In that moment of his foolish hesitation, Technoblade swung his whip out like a fisherman, casting a hook into the deep dark. It blazed like a comet in reverse, arching up into the shattered sky instead of towards the burning ground. Justice made metal. It caught around the heel of the god and made him mortal in his fear. If Techno had any godliness left in himself, he used it all in that one last act of retribution. He had known, of course, that even the weakest human was able to do impossible things, godly things, in moments of panic. He had heard stories of fathers lifting whole trees off their children, of people standing between their lovers and wild wolves. He had witnessed soldiers fighting to their bitter ends, all for a king that did not love them and a kingdom that would forget their names the moment a new battle began. A young boy had stood before him in a wisteria-covered pavilion and asked to be taught the art of war to keep his brother safe. Humans, Techno thought. We're a stubborn bunch, aren't we? And he drew the spider down from the stars. A dream hurtled back towards them, an angel fallen and falling still, and Techno swung him straight towards the bell. There was a cacophony as the bell's binding snapped, and it crashed into the floor, still ringing, still singing. Its dented surface laid a god in response, blood staining his golden hair, unconscious, defeated, at last. Techno let out a shaky breath. Well, he said, that was easy, and he promptly passed out. Wilbur let his bow clatter to the ground and caught Techno before he could f follow it. Laughter exploded out of Wilbur as he pulled Techno's limp body against him. We did it, he exhaled against Techno's hair, looking down at the god lying broken in his dented bronze. We actually frickin' did it. Techno, 
He shook Techno. Techno, hey, we did it. There was no response. Wolver looked up in panic and found his father's wary eyes on him. No, the frenzy and euphoria of his expected vict unexpected victory died swiftly on Wilbur's lips as he pulled Techno closer to him. He tucked his warm, fragile, mortal body into the cradle of his arms, Techno's chin digging painfully into Wilbur's shoulder. Wilbur was suddenly very aware of the extent of the damage on him, wounded shoulders and a knife to the back, courtesy of Wilbur himself. A killing blow for you would be a scratch for me, what Techno had said, but he'd said it when he was immortal and untouchable. Techno, Wilbur asked again, shaking him lightly, unable to think of a word, of a world without his best friend. His newfound mortality should have given them, a y given them years, at least, together, not minutes, not seconds. Techno, this isn't funny anymore. He looked up his father. Tell him it isn't funny anymore. The silence was thunderous. And then, in its wake, there was a muffled groan. Ugh, five minutes, just five goodness darned minutes. Wilbur pulled back to see that Techno's eyes were wide open. If I weren't so sure you were halfway to hell already, Wilbur said slowly, I would expedite the process right now. Does hell offer a hot meal and a warm bed? asked Techno. If so, please send me there. I deserve it. Wilbur shoved Techno off of him, unsure whether to laugh or cry or scream. When he turned to his father, he looked just as lost. That was, father said as Techno righted himself, a very shirt thing to do, you little jerk. Oh, the wire mirth fled instantly from Techno's face, chased by unbridled anger as he wh whirled on father. You want to speak to me about doing very stupid things? Father flinched, but looked as if he had already expected the outburst. His blue eyes slid to Wilbur, and they looked so much like Tommy's in his final moments that Wilbur did not know whether to look away or memorize them. Father's hands around Dream's wrist, Dream's panicked flight, the dark doorway into a realm between realms still standing open far between in the shadowy shadow of the bell tower. You're actually leaving me again, Wilbur had accused him before they were swept up in dramatics of Dream's escape and their presumed triumph. What triumph was there to celebrate when Father had not proven him wrong? The cold settled back into Wilbur's bones. When are you going? Wilbur demanded. Will, Father began, running a shaky hand through his hair. You were not supposed to be here for this. He met Techno's glare. Neither of you were. Techno crossed his arms. The mortal who had chained a god, if he had given anyone else that look he was giving father, they would have withered away into dust. And what exactly is this, Phil? Techno asked, his voice hoarse. The angel of death did not frown or make excuses. He simply told them what Wilbur had always wanted from him, the truth. I'm going away. Far, far away, Wilbur Philza continued, unable to stop now that he had started. Maybe it was the way that Wilbur was looking at him, open un and undefended, as if he no longer feared but instead expected this betrayal. Maybe it was the way the Techno stood protectively in front of him, as if Philza was someone Wilbur needed, to protection needed protection from. Maybe it was that despite their earlier tearless farewell, deep down, Philza knew it would come down to this. No subterfuge, no vague remarks. Just honesty this time, no matter how harsh and painful. I'll take Dream to a place where he can't hurt you, can't hurt anyone, ever again. And I'm going to lock the door behind me and throw away the key. It's the only way to make sure he can't come back. The only way? Wilbur asked. The only way to end the reign of an all-powerful deity just so happens to involve you leaving me in the dust for... How many times is it now, Filza? How many times are you going to leave me before you even say a proper freaking goodbye? We already don't give me that shirt wilbur snapped his brown eyes furious he gotten in his eye he's gotten his eyes from his mother the fury from his father a few words of wisdom and a piece of freaking jewelry does not count as a goodbye in any god's darned universe i asked you i freaking asked you if you if it was a goodbye goodbye then said filza is that what you wanted did you want me to say the words did you want me to tell you that i would give up air and life and open skies if it meant I got to stay with you. But if you want honesty, Wilbur, here it is. You know the face of sacrifice well. You've already made the calculations in your head, and you already know this is the right call, the only call. You already know this will hurt like hell, but it will be necessary hurt. This will be my blue valley, Wilbur. He saw the words land, felt it as if he'd taken a dagger to his own heart. Wilbur had the look of a man standing at the gallows, but it was not his execution, and that tortured sorrow in his eyes, torn between grieving and refusing to believe there was anything to grieve at all, that was from Filza too. 
Through it all, Techno had stood in his stoic silence, content on making Philza feel the weight of his anger without having to say a word. But now he opened his mouth to speak, but it wasn't a demand or a dry remark or a sharp approach that fell out, that fell out in quiet, hesitant syllables. It was a question. Wilbur, can I see that necklace? His anguish momentarily clouded by confusion. Wilbur reached into his pocket and pulled out Phil's last gift, the only remnant that would remain of him. Sitting on Wilbur's palm, dangling from an iron chain, was a single bright green emerald. I'm sorry, Phil's began. I'm sorry that leaving you is the only way I can save you. I'm sorry that you both fought so hard, so long, just to say goodbye again. I'm sorry that I can't be here for the aftermath. I'm sorry that there's too much left, unsaid between us. I'm sorry I was too much of a coward to say all this before, but I hope I can make it up to you now. He tried for a smile, even as tears blurred his vision, turning everything into a hazy smudge. Will, techno I, and then arms were going around him, pulling him into a warm embrace. For a moment, there was only a tangle of limbs and three beating broken hearts, indiscriminate from each other. Clarity came in bittersweet waves. It was Wilbur's face buried in his left shoulder, Techno's arms around them both. It was Techno's foot on his toes and the palm out of Wilbur's rapier digging into his gut. It was tragic and it was clumsy. It was goodbye. It won't be forever, Philza promised, though, his so through his sobs. I swear on you both. I will find a way back to you. Someday, there will be nothing to fear anymore, and I'll find you again, even if it takes me eons. None of them said what they were all thinking. Wilbur didn't have eons, and neither did Techno now. But they knew what he meant anyway, and they believed him. Someday. They would hang on to that promise. They would take it to their graves. If there's one thing, Wilbur said, pulling back to look Phil's in the eyes, that I want you to know. I forgive you. His face fractured into a million different emotions. I forgive you, Dad. Thank you, Phil whispered. Thank you, my boy. And Techno only had his silence, but it said more than Phil's could in a thousand years. He stepped back from them, his oldest son and his oldest friend. When Techno began swaying on his feet, Wilbur wordlessly wrapped his arm around the former gods, and they stood there together, leaning on each other. Philza's heart was free. He gave them a nod. Techno looked away to wipe furiously at his eyes. Philza had to stifle a laugh, stubborn, until the very end. Aren't you, my friend? It was time. The god of freedom turned towards the boy sleeping on the broken bell, sleeping, or waiting, or dreaming, whatever explanation would hurt least for him. Philza gathered the green god into his arms, as he had once borne the body of his youngest son at his deathbed, as he had once carried Wilbur to bed when he was smaller and the world was only the hallway from the library to his childhood bedroom. He walked to the very edge of the tower with only a young king and a new mortal to mourn him. He spread his wings, obsidian feathers gleaming into the dying fires of the last city he would ever fail to protect, and then he flew. He did not look back. The wind was at his face, cold and cutting, but he had never tasted anything sweeter. When he began his descent, straight towards the gate, to his final fate, he felt the green god stir slightly in his arms, a child disturbed from a beautiful dream. He might have whispered a name, but it was lost in the air. God, such a big word for such a small thing. They were the beginning, and they would be the end. Prologue and epilogue. The void rushed towards them. Philza closed his eyes. It was better this way. He would get to control the darkness. It was his call, his terms, his sacrifice. I'm sorry, Tommy, he thought, one last tear slipping down his ancient face. But I'll be seeing you soon. They entered the void together. The gate closed behind them, and the universe shifted. The shift was felt by every soul. It was felt by every rock and every blade of grass, every flowing river and every tree looking over a lonely house at the end of a long road, its chimney overgrown with ivy. It was felt by every beast in the forest and every fish in the sea and every bird now grieving a fellow wanderer of the skies. It was felt by those awake and those hurting and those deep in the hibernation and those spinning their webs from branch to branch, creating connections where once there was only open air. It was felt by the deer caught between the wolf's jaw, its final moments extended to, into eternity as the entire world, the entire universe, held its breath. It was felt by every warrior in combat, every monarch on their gilded thrones, every smith with their cheeks warm from the fire of their forges, every child stumbling through their mother's gardens, every painter seated at their easel, every sailor at sea, every traveler on their way home. It was felt by an old neighbor looking after the shop of the kind girl who always had been so kind to him. A sign stood at the door, closed indefinitely, it said, but the neighbor knew it would 
be closed forever, and still he'd come, day after day. His wife was gone, and so was the kind girl, but the flowers, oh, they still needed watering. It was felt by a god in a valley. Beside him was a freshly dug grave with only a sword and pure obsidian to mark its place amongst the dead. The god had always known that he would one day stand alone. Once there were three, and now there was one. He'd lost one of them to love and the other to fear, and some days he wondered if there was any difference. When pain always came in the wake of love, when every devotion led to a burial ground, when every dream was a nightmare sleeping, would it be worth loving at all? Yes, said the dirt underneath his fingernails, testimony to his lonely gr grave digging. Yes, said the wind coming in from the north. Yes, said the first drop of rain striking his cheek like a cold reminder to seek shelter, like a gentle kiss from two lost friends. Yes, it would. It was felt by a soldier knocking on the door of a home he could no longer recognize. When his sister opened the door, he swore she didn't recognize him either. But then she threw her arms around him, sobbing into his dirty shirt, and they fell into the wooden floors that carried the weight of their shared childhoods and its scratches and dents. He held her and cried, and was known. It was felt by a young king, standing on a bell tower at the heart of a city of snow and ashes, a green stone gleaming at his throat, heavy with a history he would some day be told when its last storyteller was ready. It was felt by the storyteller. The wheel was broken at their feet. They were free, they were free, they were free. Wilbur leaned his weary head against Techno's shoulder. Let's go home, he whispered. Techno nodded. Home, he repeated, as if the word was a new discovery. And, as he watched, an aurora blazed to life above them, a symphony of reds and golds and greens twisting through the heavens, an impossibility of color, nothing short of divine magic. The sky was singing. Techno turned to the king, but his face was upturned in a glow, a child, truly, captivated by the pretty lights, the heaviness of his own heart momentarily forgotten as he looked up at the brilliance of their world. The world his father had saved, the curtains fell on the two brothers, illuminated. They buried him under the weeping willow, and they, re and they replanted the garden around him, one rose bush at a time. Wilbur leaned against the simple gravestone as he turned his guitar. It bore a name and the only titles that had ever mattered to him, brother and son. I'm not nervous, said Wilbur, as he continued tinkering with the instrument on his lap. He flinched as a rather discordant note played before continuing. I mean, I shouldn't be. Whatever happens today, I would deserve it. That's how justice works, right? Finally satisfied with his strings, Wilbur strummed a few notes before he settled back against the grass. But I didn't come here to talk about that. I wanted to play you a song. He grinned at the sunlight streaming through the branches. I finally finished it. It took a while, a full year, drawled out an all too familiar voice of banging around the music room and threatening to suffocate me in my sleep if I interfered with his artistic process. Wilbur glared good naturally at the man coming towards him, a violin case in hand. Techno had grown into mortality, better than Wilbur had expected. There were still times that Techno forgot he had human needs and human limitations, but Wilbur was there, as he always had been and always would be, to remind him. Other than the times he forgot to eat on a regular schedule, or thought to spar with royal guards that would no longer be easy targets for him, he had thrived. He'd begun filling in his tunics, and his wounds from his final confrontation were now just a part of his tapestry of scars. Settling on the other side of the gravestone, anyone looking out from their windows of the castle would only see the head advisor and right hand of the king, with his old-fashioned poofy sleeves and pink hair braided down his back, silently plucking at his violin. I was just saying, Wilbur said, that whatever the verdict, we'd accept it, Techno finished, brows scrunched in a serious contemplation of his instrument. That doesn't mean you're not allowed to be scared. That's why we're here, aren't we? He threw a grin at Wilbur across the strings. We're getting you a distraction. I'm not scared, Wilbur said, and it was the truth. I know there's a chance that the past two years of atoning might not be enough, and I know it will never be enough. Then it's a good thing you're not the only one voting, Techno said simply. It's the people's call, Wilbur. We don't have any say in the matter. For better or for worse, he tapped the end of his bow against the gravestone, almost absently, before raising it to his violin. At the end of the day, you're either king or you aren't, and if they decide the latter, then we'll go off into exile together and be twin fishermen in some little coast town somewhere. Or traveling bards. We could see the world together, you and I. I've already seen it, said Techno, but I suppose I wouldn't mind getting a second look. Wilbur laughed lightly. If that's our worst-case scenario, then there really is nothing to fear, is there? 
In response, Techno began playing the first notes of a familiar melody. Soon, the lilting sound of his violin filled the garden, joining by a distant bird song and the rustle of the wind through the creeping branches. It floated through the air, sharp and sweet, Techno's scarred fingers dancing across the fingerboard with an expertise that cost him long nights and strings snapping against his skin. His bow wrung magic from the delicate instrument. So potent, Wilbur almost missed his own cue. Wilbur began playing his guitar, an accompaniment, and an addition. The undercurrent to the keening sound of Techno's violin, one note after another, an orchestra of two performing for an audience of ghosts, following a score they wrote themselves. It was a sad song. It was a happy song. It was a song of summer day from years ago, tucked between faded memories like a flower pressed between the pages of a heavy book, now dusted off and clean. It was a song of an artist, mother, and a warrior father, and sons that were both. It was a song about the grass beneath Wilbur's feet and the sweet scent of flowers in his lungs. It was a song about war and ruin and grief and loss and the nightmares that still managed to take him by surprise, even when he was awake and living anyway. It was a song about love and all the ways to say it. Sacrifice and a cup of hot tea waiting at the desk. Chess during the lazy days and music during the hard ones. Leaving and staying, remembering and forgetting. It was a song about family, born or made or found or rediscovered. It was Tommy's grave at his back, mother's unfinished painting, father's necklace around his neck. And when the final note echoed off into silence, there was no standing ovation, no Rachel's applause. Just like the voices for the past two years, six months and three days, there was only silence. It was the most beautiful sound. Wilbur quietly placed his guitar against Tommy's gravestone and turned to see Techno wordlessly returning his violin into its case. Everything had already been said. In the distance, the bells began to toll. It was time. Techno offered Wilbur a hand and pulled him to his feet. Together, they walked towards their judgment. Two years ago, Wilbur had stood on a balcony and faced an army ready to die for him. I promised you peace on my father's crown, he'd said, and now I call you to war. This is nothing less than treason. Rest assured, I will be facing consequences for it. And the soldiers had called instead for their enemies' heads. More than half of them were dead now, leaving family and friends behind, alive and safe, but mourning. And if there was anyone who understood the need to find some place to put down blame, it was Techno. There was no enemies left to defeat, no smiling gods to imprison, no hostile armies crossing the valley, and that was why Techno and Wilbur were standing in the hazy sunlight pouring in from the high windows of the very room where Wilbur had once been crowned, the room where he might have that crown taken from him for good. In front of them, seated in pews and on the floor, or leaning against the marble columns or watching from the balconies, were the people that would determine their fates. A hundred blinking eyes, all unreadable, settled on the king and the general that had won both battle and war, at the cost of the very people they'd sworn to protect. Never mind that they'd saved them from a worse fate. Never mind that they'd ensured the safety of the kingdom for generations to come, or that they'd spent the last two years working on pulling the threads of their nation back together. Those were excuses that neither Wilbur nor Techno would ever use against their people. Before them were four jars, each towering over them, one for each quadrant, west and east, south and north. For the past few months, those jars had combed through the every inch and corner of the kingdom, from the highest mountains to the smallest villages, tucked into the deepest forest to the cold snow-covered tundra towns. Messengers had knocked on the door of each house, presenting each person within, be they child or adult, a decision. They would take a rock, any rock, be it from their own gardens or from the river bend, or chipped from the threshold of their houses, and place it in the jar if they believed the king and the general had not done enough in service to the kingdom. A representative stood behind each jar, ready to tip it over, ready to count. Enough votes and Wilbur would step down from the throne, and Techno would go with him, and they'd live the rest of their mortal lives in exile, far away from the kingdom they had they had bled and fought and lost their brother for. Techno glanced at Wilbur. Despite his earlier posturing, Techno could tell Wilbur was one tug away from unraveling. He stood shoulder to shoulder with Techno, trying to look as calm and stoic for his people, spine straight and eyes ahead. Only Techno could see the apprehension behind them. He loved his kingdom. He loved its people. It wasn't just his father's kingdom or his mother's or Tommy's. He'd given everything of himself into it. It was his own flesh and blood. It was no longer a chore or something he had to succeed in to earn a distant father's approval. It was the soldiers that had fought beside him in the valley. 
he was half a hundred people that had been willing to bring down a mountain on their foes and on themselves. It was the scars on his skin and his sleepless nights, and his pride in his home and his responsibility. He was born for this, stones and all. A judge, draped in white robes, called for attention, as if the room had not been mind-numbingly quiet for the past half hour. Citizens of our fair kingdom, the judge said, we gather today to bear witness to the conclusion of the trial of King Wilbur, protector of the realm, ruler of the kingdom, and Technoblade, former general of the royal army. The people have spoken. Now all there is left to do is listen. He turned to Wilbur, his gray eyebrows rising in question. Would you like one last thing to say, your majesty, before we tip the jars? Wilbur opened his mouth, closed it, began shaking his head. Techno stepped forward. The king, he began, as well as I, thank you all for coming here today. I see familiar faces in the crowd. I fought next to you, have seen your bravery firsthand, and I know what it cost all of you to come here today. He took a very deep breath, met every eye on the floor in mezzanine. It felt like standing before the dead. It felt like a reckoning long overdue. Everybody here lost someone to the war, a friend, a parent, a neighbor, and you know what your king lost too. Though we are united in our loss, that does not excuse the lapse in me and Wilbur's judgments. We made mistakes, deadly ones. We believed ourselves invincible and were too late to act against the encroaching enemy. And you all paid for a price that should have been ours alone. Whatever you have all decided today, we will call it justice, that is all. When Techno stepped back, Wilbur caught at his sleeve. He anticipated a dry remark about how his his unexpected diplomacy, and was surprised when Wilbur simply mouthed, Thank you. Techno nodded hesitantly at him, confused as to what there was to be thankful for. After all, he was only doing his job. The judge read out more legal jargon that Techno had already heard a hundred times before, and then, with the, with the very hands he'd used to put a crown on Wilbur's head, he gestured for the jars to be overturned. They looked like vases, they gleamed like urns. Wilbur's hand slipped into Techno's, his bitten down nails digging into Techno's knuckles. Techno closed his eyes. He did not know which gods would still listen to him, so he prayed to them all. The war god, Dream, Filza, Exile, or Exoneration. It was out of his hands. He'd be ready for both. Techno waited for the clatter of the stones on the marble. It never came. The boy who had come of age in blood and fire stood before a lake with his first fist curled gently around a stone. The surface of the lake was calm and still, a mirror of sky above it, and Tubbo wondered what it would feel like to float in it, to swim in sunlight. By this time, in a city far from here, the king and the general Tubbo had followed into war would be counting the votes of those who wanted them gone. Tubbo ran his thumb along the smooth edge of a stone in his hand, turning it idly between his fingers as he looked out at the lake. It would freeze over soon, when winter came. Tubbo would be ready then. He pulled his hand back and through, with all his might. The stone skipped once, twice, thrice, across the surface before sinking into the blue sky, leaving ripples that disappeared in a blink of an eye, and the lake was still once more. Tubbo grabbed the axe, clung from his hip. It was starting to rust, and constant use had worn away the handle, but it would hold for just a bit more. It was a familiar, reliable weight in his hand, and he swung it behind, beside him as he walked towards the forest. He needed more firewood to keep his sister warm. Time unfurled like a ribbon. They filled their days with mundane problems. Untuned instruments, tea turning cold and weeds needing picking. The dutiful, benevolent king and his right-hand man who struggled, who struggled to stay awake during half of the political meetings and spent the other half actively antagonizing psychopaths. He deemed too irksome. Wilbur had publicly proclaimed that there was nothing amusing about Techno threatening to burn the pompous wig off of a merchant trying to lobby trade routes away from local vendors, but his eyes had gleamed with a promise of later laughter. In the spring, the two of them went down to the orchards and spent their days in friendly rivalry over who picked the most fruit. Most years, Techno won, if only because Wilbur was often distracted by a woman with long, curly hair as red as the apples in her basket. It took him two years to ask her name, another two to ask her to marry him. Her name was Sally, and she said yes. When their first child was born, a baby boy with hair the color of Tommy's last sunset, Wilbur took him into his arms without hesitation. He pressed his tear-stained cheek against his son's warm skin and whispered, I will love you forever, over and over, until he was sure his son knew it. And his son would grow up under no one's shadow, calling Wilbur dad and techno uncle, in a kingdom of hard-worn peace. 
In time, he would know the story of the Blue Valley and the story of his other uncle and the story of his grandparents. But until then, he would think of all, he would think all gods were kind and his father never cried. His uncle would carve his height into the marble column of an ivory-covered pavilion where he learned how to paint, and he would wonder why his father's brother would turn away whenever he passed the almost faded marks on the bo marks of the boy that had stood there before him. The heir of the angel of death's kingdom, and all the heirs after him, would not have gilded hair or eyes like a frozen tundra. They would have gentle hands and would forgive easily. They would be raised on honey and apple pies and stories about frogs in the rain, and the wheel would never break them. On the night before an ancient crown would be placed upon their brow, those that came before them would press a gift into their hand, and it would be their inheritance. So when a winged man would appear from the north, days or years or eons from now, he would find a familiar stone around the neck of a child that he would recognize right away by the familiar shape of their smile, and he would know he was home. He had a life before this, a mother, a father, a home, sisters, and brothers, but what he had now was all right, too. He stood alone in front of his bedroom mirror, combing his hair back from his face to braid it out for the day, tucking it behind an ear where a sapphire earring hung, catching the sunlight. He paused when he saw it, leaning, leaned in close just to make sure it wasn't a trick of the light or the lingering traces of a dream. He blinked once, twice, his mortal heart catching in his throat. There, nestled among the pink strands, delicate as a bird's wing, was a single gray hair. If he listened carefully, he could hear his brother coming down the hallway, looking for him. But this moment was his alone. Half sobbing, half laughing, he fell against his chair and closed his eyes against the sudden sting of tears. He could see in his mind a field of flowers under an open sky, a place made for waiting, where all the finished stories went, where he would go some day too. A knock came on the door. Technoblade began to smile. And guys, guess what? That's it. That's the end. We read it. If that's all you were waiting for, then you can click off now, but I'm going to continue talking. <laughs> and that was Passerine by Blue Jamas Thiscus. The, their name will be on the screen because I don't know how to pronounce it still. Thank you for this amazing journey. Um, thank you, Thiscus, for this fic. This fic... I'm, everyone has given you all the love and all the fan art. I'm sure you know how much everyone loves this fic. But this was one of the very first fics that I ever read for the Dream SMP fandom. And it was just so emotional and so wonderful. And it meant so much to me. So finally getting, after a year of wanting to make these videos, finally getting to make these videos, it just means so much to me that I finally get to do it. And as I'm sure you can tell from these videos, this story was so emotional to me and I can't help but cry during the end. So yes, <laughs> I hope that didn't make the story any less good in your opinion to have to hear it through my tears and you can go and read it yourself. The link is always in the description. Um, I'm gonna show, here's a piece of fan art I made about a year ago for this wonderful fic. I don't even want to call this a fanfic, this is like a full-blown novel. It's amazing. And so just thank you guys for listening, for being here, and for allowing me to do this. I really hope you guys all have enjoyed as much as I enjoyed making these. And I hope you guys will be open and happy to see what comes in the future. I don't know what will happen next but i want to continue on this road of the unexpected and i would like to continue doing some stuff from this fandom as well as star versus the force of evil so uh thank you for listening and i hope you guys have a great rest of your day one more time a big thank you to this guest thank you for this big and thank you all for watching it means so much to me i say again goodbye everybody and have a great rest of your day